Welcome to I'm a Millionaire, So Now What? The advice podcast for self-made millionaires. I'm your host, Colleen O'Connell Campbell. Through my work, I hope to normalize the idea that creating wealth through your business is a good thing. In this podcast, you'll find inspirational stories, practical strategies, and fun, frank advice from diverse business minds. Well, hello and welcome. Colleen O'Connell Campbell here, your host. Welcome to another show. I'm a millionaire, so now what? We're back into interview mode. And you guessed it. On today's episode, you're going to meet James Chalmer, another person I've connected with through LinkedIn. Okay, well, let me tell you a little bit about James before we actually ship over to our chat an internationally experienced strategist and executive specializing in physical products, James invests, advises, and mentors ventures and their founders from early stage development through to commercialization. So something you should know about James. And one of the reasons I wanted to bring him on the show amongst uh, the fact that he's exited a number of businesses is he's not necessarily the founder. In fact, he's pretty well not the founder. He comes in at early stages, but not at the very beginning. And he helps to grow and scale a business and move it on up to exit strategy. He focuses on medical devices and consumer health technology, as sometimes he sees it as the best way to democratize and provide universal access to health and wellness and to minimize the burdens of successful commercialization. He focuses on differentiation as a long-term value proposition that's been a crucial element of his success over the years. He credits many of the awards he and the companies he has led with success in doing things differently rather than chasing the doing better. These awards and accolades include Forbes and Inc.'s fastest growing companies, X Prize Awards, and B Corporation's Best for the World. As chief strategist and partner at Cortex Design, he is leading the scale-up efforts of this now 22-year-old firm. In addition to growing their presence in North America, James has successfully positioned Cortex as a gateway partner for European firms looking to enter the U.S. market. So here we go. Let's have a chat with James Chalmer, partner and chief strategist, Cortex Design. Well, James, thanks for joining us here on I'm a Millionaire, So Now What? I'm grateful that you could carve out a little bit of time. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Okay. So I've shared here um, a bit of your bio background with uh, the South Main Nation. So they know that you like to get involved with uh, businesses, not exactly at startup, but definitely while there's in major growth Uh, opportunities and help um, substantially scale those businesses and um, told them you've exited a few times. So I'm hoping that what we can do today is chat about um, a number of these businesses along the way and uh, how you felt that um, you contributed and what you saw um, were were the great um, pieces uh, that came together in order to scale. And then of course, uh, let's hear about uh, what's the the new and uh, the happening right now. How does that sound? That sounds great. Look forward perfect. to it. Perfect, perfect. So um, let's let's rewind before the businesses. Like, uh, what's your like? Why did what got you interested anyway in this uh, business scale up? Uh, you know, I I grew up on a farm, um, and you know, at a very young age, developed this fascination for growth. Um, and so like back in the day, it would have been seeing crops grow. Uh, and today it's, you know, it's working with companies that are running our own companies, 
um, and just you know seeing the same sort of growth. Um, you know, really, we'll talk about it later, I'm sure. But you know, we're always looking for opportunities to do things that that others aren't willing or aren't looking to do. And so, there's something just really exciting about that for me. Well, that's interesting that uh, you know we didn't talk about that background when we when we met that there's a, a farming background, but uh, you know I've often used a bit of the you know analogy in my investment part of the world that you know you let things grow and then you have to harvest things off and then then grow some more and then harvest things off. So and that's it. It's interesting. Um, okay, so um, along the way here, what would you say was the first um, solid um, venture was it like the first time you jumped into the into the space was that successful or was there a couple of tries um so the first time I will say was a bit of a hybrid um I wasn't an equity owner in the firm but you know while I was still in university I convinced an ownership group to allow me to become general manager of a small business they had um and you know at the age of 22 it's usually pretty tough to convince someone to let you take the reins over of their company. Um, but, you know, they really saw it as, as no major risk. Uh, the company wasn't doing very well and, uh, and I was willing to do it relatively inexpensively as a stopgap measure for them, but I negotiated a, a nice uh, performance incentive. And um, so were there mistakes along the way? Absolutely. Uh, and one of the things I've learned from that opportunity was that moving forward, I would always allow those around me to make the same number of mistakes. Um, you know, without those mistakes, you're not growing, you're not pushing boundaries. It's just, you know, can you can you identify when you've made a mistake, uh, get out early and not repeat the same mistakes twice? Right. So it also sounds like there's been a bit of an appetite for um, what on the outside might look like taking on additional risk, but at the same time, if you have confidence in yourself and, and you know what you want to do and you, you, you believe you have a plan, it's maybe not as risky as it looks from the outside because, you know, from what you said, oh, I take a really small salary and, you know, I will, I will produce X, Y, and Z. And then you can pay me this really great bonus, but not a lot of people want to live like that. Uh, no. So, you know, I, uh, I've said it before in interviews, um, uh, I've since day one in my career, I've taken a $60,000 salary. Um, I took that back in 2000 and I've taken it every year since, uh, I've never increased it. And, uh, and so I, I think more than anything, it's, you know, at an early stage, I understood that if you wanted to be successful, um, you know, there was only a couple of ways to build wealth. Uh, I wasn't in a position to inherit it. Uh, and so for me, it was, how do I, how do I do more with my time? Um, how do I take on a little bit of risk in order to see that upside? I do think that there's a level of, you have to have the confidence in your own abilities. Um, but, you know, if we go back to that first role with the ownership group, um, you know, I was a 22 year old GM and I remember sitting at my desk on my first day and, uh, and, you know, at that point, laptops were, were new technology. And mm -hmm. I remember typing into my, typing into my laptop roles and responsibilities of a general manager. I had no idea. <laughs> what to do. Right. And, and so. Sounded you know, like a my, good title. <laughs> it, it sounded like a great title. And, uh, and so my assistant at the time um, sort of came into the office and asked me if I wanted coffee and I offered to go get her one instead. And she's like, you have no idea how this looks. And I'm like, I really don't. And she said, you know what, you've got a great team. Um, and, you know, those words out of Aggie's mouth have, have sort of have been words that I've, I've woken up to every day. Um, it is about bringing, you know, the right people at the right time around you to, to allow um, you know, businesses to flourish. So that um, that first endeavor as the as a GM, um, how long uh, were you in that role, and and then take us to the you know the next step along the journey? Yeah, so that was a uh, that was a small company. Um, we uh, I was in that role in a full time capacity for about five years. Um, there were a lot of micro fails along the way. 
Uh, I tried to do a whole host of things uh, that didn't work out. Uh, luckily, the the ownership structure allowed me to make those mistakes and um, and then just get out of them quickly. Um, but we did we did have a very successful business there. Uh, you know, when I joined it, we were sub one million. When I left, we were managing forty five million dollars worth of business, um, and so that was a a really nice uptick. Um, and you know, and it was a natural progression into another business that they had that at the time needed uh, needed some support, and so um, so I joined that company uh, as part of the the process, and so that was uh, that was the hydraulic source. Okay, and so um, the hydraulic source then um, was that the next step into taking on some an ownership piece at that stage or, or was there still a little bit more learning to do there? Uh, no. So that was the first time, uh, that was the first time where I started uh, having true equity positions. And so uh, after a rebrand, a rebrand from the hydraulic source to HSI, we focused on being a, uh, a full service warehouse sales marketing office for four manufacturers. And, uh, and so that's where I started to be able to take equity stakes in the businesses that we were uh, running Canadian and North American operations for. Okay. And um, was, did that become an exit or did that just become a, a, like, did you just, or did you exit? What did that look like? So that was a series of, uh, of smaller exits. Um, it was also, I would say, in my entire career, it's probably the the time that I've been the riskiest. Um, I was still I was still young. I was sub thirty. Um, you know, there was an air of confidence after the first big win that I could do anything, and I was invincible. And so, you know, we certainly we we took a we took a lot of risk uh, with some of the ventures that we did there. Um, I will say that you know, eleven out of twelve of them failed. Um, and that's significant, right? Yeah, it, it, it was. Um, but the, the, the 12th one, um, which we had sort of developed about halfway through, uh, my tenureship there, um, was a huge success. And so it, it more than made up for, uh, for all of the failures, but, you know, in my career, I would say that that was, that was really probably some of the most transformative time, um, because, you know, in those failures, I really was able to hone in on what I what I did as a professional and where I could create value um, for companies. I know it's said over and over again that it's the the it's when we fail that we learn the most, that we're actually growing the most. Um, and it's so easy to read that or to say that, but um, you know, to actually be able to not resist it, like to actually put your foot forward with the risk of fail failure is, is not necessarily that easy. And yet, um, that's what we see every day when, uh, when people decide to take that, take that step and become a business owner, um, and that, that risk. So, um, one out of 12 <laughs> in, in, in school, that would definitely be a failure, right? But in the, in the school of uh, real life, uh, that is, uh, that's tremendous success. What, could you think of like one or two, you know, top highlighted things that you learned out of that experience that you would share? Yeah. So number one is focus. Um, you know, I, I'm routinely speaking on it. I'm routinely practicing it in our businesses. Um, you know, the those those failures all sort of came back to this element of, of focus, um, and it was really the idea of focusing on one thing and doing that um, doing that differently than everyone else. Uh, not actually better, uh, just different. And so, you know, when I when I left the ownership group after about 14 years uh, together. Um, I recognized that the rest of my career was going to be focused on doing things differently, um, going into markets that, you know, that there was just an expectation of how you might engage as a service firm or as a, as a hardware uh, developer and, um, and focused on, you know, the areas that we could do things differently. 
Right. So then um, there's another couple of steps in between from the, what we just talked about, the um, hydraulics source. Did I get that right? And yeah, so, into towards cortex, there's a couple more steps there in the ladder, right? Yeah. So I I did uh, I did two more uh, two more businesses between uh, spent about three years at each. Uh, one was uh, one was a consumer uh, a consumer product development firm, um, and uh, and the second was a services firm. And uh, and the services firm was was built around uh, creating infrastructure, intellectual property, and framework around uh, leveraging partnerships for business uh, to meet business objectives. Um, it you know in in many ways I'll say it was my second greatest failure um, because we were never we were never able to really scale it as a business though you know that was always the plan. Um, that being said, we were able to create a nice. A nice baseline uh, business value that we were able to exit that for another firm to incorporate it into their business. So different degrees of success. Different degrees of success. Um, you know, my goal was uh, my goal, in fact, was to leave uh, was to leave Tac Ten after we exited that business um, and and take at least a couple of years off. Um, I exited the business in February 2020, uh, and in March 2020, all of my travel was canceled. Um, and so that really gave me uh, that really gave me the luxury of, of being able to to sort of look back on what I had done in my career. I didn't have um, any active business interests at the time, uh, other than a couple of investments, and uh, and so I really got to think, you know, again spend some time with my thoughts and, and look at what had happened in my career uh, to the state and, um, and sort of plan for the next, the next chapter. So what we talked about um, when we initially connected through LinkedIn was that um, your uh, sort of zone of genius is in being able to see there's an existing company there and you're, you, you have this ability to see what it needs to do to get to the next level. You're not necessarily, um, you, you know, you're not the one coming up with the initial idea, right? Because like, I'd like to talk about that a little bit. I knew you had to go there. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, I'm, you know, I'm the person that comes in to scale something. Uh, I'm not the person that builds it, you know, from day one. That was a big learning for me from TAC10. Um, you know, I thought as as an entrepreneur, that meant that you had to be able to be the one to come in on day one and, and sort of create the value proposition and then take it forward. Um, I realized through that experience that that wasn't actually the kind of entrepreneur that I that I am. Um, you know, today, Cortex is a 22 year old business that uh, that we're taking forward um, and, you know, it has all of the pieces in place. Um, it just didn't have them in the right order to take it from where it is today to a to a truly global player in the space. And that's what um, that's what you're going to do. Let's talk about um, Cortex just a little bit. Can you um, describe a little bit more of what Cortex does? Who do you supply to? You know, what's the problem you're solving? Yeah, so Cortex is a is a full service design and engineering firm for physical products. Uh, so we'll work with clients from startup through to Fortune 500, um, developing uh, developing products that align with the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and uh, and really the value proposition for us is that we engage differently. Uh, first and foremost, I wake up every day, and the hat I'm wearing is one of investor. And so every client we work with, whether we have an opportunity to, an opportunity to invest or not, um, we're engaging with them as though we are invested. And so, you know, everyone on our team from, you know, a communications intern through to my business partners know that every decision we make has to prioritize our clients, uh, our clients p &L. And if we're taking care of their p &L, everything else falls into place for us. Yeah, that is a that is a different way of looking at how to interact with your 
customers. So rather than looking at them as your customers, you're saying we're actually part of your business. We're integrated into your success is essentially what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. So that um, it's interesting. It's different, but um, like I can see the can see the possibilities. As I was looking, <laughs> we're we're mostly audio here, but I just kind of did this look gaze way out into the future <laughs> as I said that. You know. So when I looked at it, um, you know, it's easy to say we can run you know a successful engineering firm, um, but that has limits. How big can I grow? How many you know? Am I going to be a, a thousand staff, two thousand staff? At what point, you know, do I hit those limits where you just can't grow any larger as a as a design firm in this space? And so, to make it limitless, um, you know, if we have, you know, over the coming years, if we can invest in twenty to thirty companies a year, um, then you know, we find ourselves with with potential long term that that is much more limitless. And so, uh, you know, it also gives us the ability to engage with our with our client base in a much different way, um, because it's it's no longer sort of the adversarial client, you know, uh, mm-hmm. vendor relationship. Which in our space, you know, the service providers do have adversarial interests to to their clients' interests. Um, you know, for our clients, they want to build out that capacity internally and one day be able to lead product development internally guided by a third party. Um, And as a service provider, we want people to just outsource the entire engagement to us. And so part of, uh, you know, part of running a different business in this space is just engaging and building out a framework to engage that's completely differentiated. Right. It actually, it sounds like to me exactly that. If you create your um, service offering in that particular space and the companies that engage with you know that you're actually going, you know that they are planning to go in-house and and actually the whole engagement is set up around that as opposed to let's, let's get your stuff off of the ground, but then let's like make sure that it's really difficult for you to take it in house. It actually opens the door for another, another business to come in and so on and so forth. It's, it's uh yeah, it's a great way. So what's the grand, it, or what's the grand vision or is there a grand vision for um, what you would like to see happen at Cortex? There is. Um, so we're not going to get into new areas of service. Um, all the baselines for service either were in place uh, or we introduced them in the last 11 months. Um, the focus is to is to take this business to become Canada's largest uh, design and engineering firm dedicated towards medical products and consumer health tech devices um, with assembly, with manufacturing services, um, and then to be, uh, to be on the radar as one of the largest investors in terms of number of, uh, number of investments made in Canadian uh, health tech startups. That's amazing. Um, if there's anyone listening who, um, you know, might be interested in interacting with Cortex, how would they get in touch? What's the best way? Uh, well, the best way to, to get me is usually, uh, is usually through LinkedIn. Um, just shoot me a quick note on LinkedIn, uh, James underscore Chalmers. Uh, or they can reach out to me through Cortex's website, uh, which is just cortex-design.com. Excellent. And um, do you have any fun, frank advice you might want to leave with the, with the listeners, with the Southway Nation here? Uh, yeah. You know, I, so I gave this, uh, I actually gave this to one of my business partners today. Um, it's not about working harder. It's about working smoother. It's a good one. Yeah, in our in our hustle hustle world, we're always talking about work hard, but that doesn't necessarily uh, uh, mean we're 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 focused, right? Which is another big thing that you said. Yeah, so uh, work smart versus work hard. It's a good way to uh, close things up. Thanks, James, for being here today. Absolutely, my pleasure, Colin. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode please leave me a five-star rating on iTunes. It'll take 
just a second and will give me the boost I need to keep showing up for you. I'm Colleen O'Connell Campbell, Wealth Advisor at RBC Dominion Securities and your host. Thank you for listening. I'm looking forward to welcoming you back again soon. TTFN. Ta-ta for now. I'm a millionaire. So now what? Is brought to you by O'Connell Campbell Wealth Management at RBC Dominion Securities. All opinions expressed by the host, Colleen O'Connell Campbell, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of RBC Dominion Securities. This podcast is for information purposes only. Before taking any action based on information in this podcast, you should consult with a qualified professional. Colleen O'Connell Campbell is a wealth advisor with RBC Dominion Securities, a member of the Canadian Investor Protection Fund.